If I die from cholesterol, at least I'll die full and happy, Jack said. He stormed out of the house, then realised he'd forgotten his shoes and had to tiptoe back in to get them. It wasn't the dramatic exit he'd been hoping for. Jack pulled up to the drive through at the Golden Heifer. Thank you for choosing Golden Heifer, if I'm saying that correctly. Order when you're ready, the voice on the speaker said. Give me the moo and oink, double bacon cheeseburger, a large fry and a peanut butter shake. I keep wanting to say snake, Jack said. That'll be 9.25. Please pull up to the window, the voice said. Jack shoved a 10 at the young cashier in the window and grabbed his order. He pulled into an empty parking space to eat his meal. When he unwrapped his burger, there was no bacon on it. Enraged, he got out of the car and stomped up to the drive through window, holding the bake uh, the burger in his hand as evidence. Yeah, that's, that's very relatable. The cashier, a petite young woman with mousy brown hair, said, I'm sorry, sir, but the drive through is for cars only. If you need to speak to someone, you need to go inside to the restaurant. I ordered the moo and oink double bacon cheeseburger and you left out the oink. Jack yelled, I'm not going inside the restaurant. I'm standing here until you make my order right. I demand bacon. <laughs> what a Karen. Uh, the cashier, who was probably still in high school, looked nervous. Our company policy is no customers on foot at the drive through I don't give a plugged nickel for what your company's policy is. I'm standing here until I get paid good money for. Un uh, until I get what I paid good money for, sorry. So, the cashier said with a quiver in her voice, there was no bacon on your burger. That's what I said, Jack thundered. Do you not speak English or are you just an idiot? I'm so sorry that you're frustrated, sir, the cashier said. I'm going to fix the problem for you, but you have to understand I'm new at this job. Today's my first day. And if you worked for me, it'd be your last, Jake said. The young woman looked like she was near tears, which Jack found strangely satisfying. Oh my god. He's an awful human being. Once his order was finally corrected, Jack stomped back to his car and gobbled down the food like a starving dog. A smoothie was not to dinner. He was a man, and men needed to eat. He knew he was consuming thousands of calories, but once the food was all gone, he still felt empty. He reached into the glove compartment and pulled out the bank statement that had come earlier in that day. Jack had a master's degree in business and was an expert number cruncher. But no matter how he crunched them, these numbers were bad. It shouldn't be this way. Many years ago, when he was in college, Jack had envisioned himself on Wall Street as a real mover and shaker in the world of finance. When that hadn't panned out, he had got a new job at a bank and started to move his way up the ranks. He worked there several years and his career had been on the rise, until he had butted heads with his superiors and yelled at his subordinates one too many times and gotten himself fired. Exactly, so the way to be good in life is to uh, be nice to others. That's, that's just life. <laughs> C'est la vie. You're great with numbers, Jack, his old boss had said. But you're terrible with people. Hard to get along with, they had said. Authoritarian personality, they had said. Jack had figured that if he built his own business, he wouldn't have to be bossed around by, it, by anybody. When the pizza restaurant building had gone up for sale, he took the plunge. Ah, I see. So it, it, it probably is like Pizzeria Simulator in a lot of ways. He knew that kind of restaurant had been a big hit in other cities. So he figured he couldn't fail. He was wrong. He frowned at the numbers on the bank statement. You didn't have to be an expert number cruncher to see that he owed more than he was earning. In Jack's pocket, his phone, the latest model which Becky had bought him for his birthday and was his money, rang. Hi dad. It was Tyson, his son, calling from college. Jack felt his dark mood lift a bit as he thought back to Tyson's childhood, the ball games and the birthday parties. Things had been happier then. Hey buddy, what's up? Uh, well, I just wanted to let you know that I had to use your credit card for a couple of things today. Tyson's voice sounded tense. One of my classes has an additional textbook I didn't know I needed and then Tyson paused. That pause made Jack nervous. And then, Jack prompted, I had a little oopsie with the car that ended up costing $900. I'm sorry, Dad. $900 is a big oopsie, a gigantic oopsie. In fact, Jack felt his face heat up with anger. I know, Dad. I, I really am sorry. It was an emergency. Sorry doesn't get me $900 back. Plus, whatever exorbitant sum you had to spend for that useless textbook. 
His voice was growing louder and louder. Tyson, you're supposed to be off school, learning how to be independent, learning how to be a man. Well, how are you going to be independent and a young man if you just reach for daddy's credit card every time you have a supposed emergency? I, I thought that's why you gave it to me for. Emergencies, Tyson said. His voice had the trembling quality it got when he was upset. Are you talking back to me? Jack roared. No, Dad, I'm just trying to understand. Well, I'm trying to understand too, Jack interrupted him. I'm trying to understand how just two people, the other one being your mother, though you don't need a college education to figure that one out, how just two people can be such an enormous drain on my finances. Jack hung up the phone before he could hear whatever sob stories Tyson was about to tell him. Bleeding him dry. His business, his family were bleeding him dry. Why couldn't they understand that he wasn't an endless source of money? They treated him like a human ATM. With a shaking hand, Jack opened the search engine screen on his phone and typed in the word bankruptcy. From the puppet... Oh, okay, okay. so we got another extract from the puppet cover. I see. I like this, I like this. By Sage Brantley. What are they? Sylvester asked the little girl. In the cardboard box was a pile of small, squirming, furry creatures. The little girl giggled. They're kittens. Have you ever seen kittens before? Oh! Wait. Hang on a second. Does this relate to the Candy Cadet story? Does it or does it not? I need to know. I feel like it does. I feel like it is a story. Unless it's like a... A, a, a miss memory. I feel like there's a story where there's five kittens, then I don't know what happens exactly, but uh, like a man like stitches them together and then puts them in a cardboard box. I swear that is a story. I swear. I need to look that up later. Um, tell me in the comments if I'm right about that. But that sounds like a very good connection there. This is, oh, that's even more evidence that this is all to do with FNAF 6. I think, possibly. I don't know. Possibly. That, that's like a very small connection as well, even if it is true. Um, but I don't know. Uh, that's just something that appeared to me. The little girl giggled. They're kittens. Have you ever seen kittens before? Sylvester shook his head. Really? The little girl said. She picked up one of the creatures. It was orange and white and made a strange mewling sound. They baby cats. I named this one Daffodil. Do you want to pet her? Sylvester reached out and gently stroked the tiny creature. Isn't she soft? The little girl said. Yes, very soft, Sylvester answered. But the truth was, the kitten could have been as hard as a rock for all he knew. He could feel nothing. Oh, oh, oh. Um, Sylvester, like all of his wooden brethren, had been created perfectly to perform the manufacturing jobs that were required of them. But because he and his brethren could not truly feel anything, they were not real. Sylvester couldn't feel the softness of a kitten or the bright sun on his face. He couldn't feel the heat from a fireplace or a cool evening breeze. He couldn't feel the hugs of friendship or the kisses of love. Sylvester could walk and talk like a man, but he wasn't fooling anybody, least of all himself. A wooden man was no man at all. More than anything, Sylvester longed to be real. Oh no. This is going to have a dark ending, I can really feel it. Today was the day. Porter had arrived at work early to set up the puppet carver on the stage. He had even gone to the office supply store and gotten the flip chart so he could explain how the machine worked in an official looking way. He wanted everything to be as professional as possible. If, if, had, sorry, it had to be if he was going to save the restaurant and everybody's jobs. Sage helped him center the puppet carver on the stage. You've really gone all out, haven't you? Sage said, looking at the flip chart, then at the uncharacteristic jacket and tie Porter was wearing. Yep, Porter said. I'm a nervous rack too. I really need this to go well. I feel like we all need it. Yeah, but no pressure, right? Sage said. Even though our, fa uh, that our futures are all in your hands. Angie came in for a shift and looked up at the stage. Hey, looking snazzy, she said to Porter. Just trying to make a good impression, Porter said. He tugged at the uncomfortable tie. He had always thought it strange that hanging a strip of cloth from your neck was supposed to make you seem more businesslike and professional. Who had decided that anyway? Angie flashed at, uh, flashed at him, flashed him 
a thumbs up. Well, I for one am impressed. Wait till you see the machine work, Porter said. Then you'll be really impressed. Jack stomped into the dining area, his face already set in a scowl. Clearly he was in a terrible mood, but what else was new? Oh, that's right, Jack said, looking up at Porter, who was on stage with his invention. Today's the day you're going to waste my time with that contraption you made. Sir, with all due respect, I don't think you'll find it a waste of time, Sage said. When Porter showed it to me, I thought it was interesting. Yeah, well, you're the one who's always working on that novel, Jack said, using exaggerated finger quotes. Show me a fiction writer, and I'll show you a liar. Ooh, <laughs> Sage opened his mouth, but before he could put his foot in it, Porter jumped in. Why don't we go ahead and get to the demonstration? Sage, can you get Edwin out of the kitchen? He wanted to see this too. Porter hoped having a small errand to run would distract Sage from the fact that Jack had just insulted him. Soon, Edwin, Angie and Sage were sitting at the table near the, the stage, smiling and cheering Porter on. Jack sat at a table in the rear and leaned back with his arms crossed over his chest. Okay, he said. Impress me. Yes, sir, Porter said. He tried to sound confident, even though he was nervous. Sage, can you give me a hand with this log? Sage stepped up and helped him feed the large piece of wood into the machine's opening. I've got it from here. Thanks, buddy, Porter said and Sage took his place back at the table. Now, I just pushed this button, and we watched the magic, Porter said. After he pushed the button, he stepped aside so everybody could have a clear view of the machine. Porter could tell right away that something was wrong. The machine was shaking too much and making a strange sputtering sound. There was an unfamiliar rattle from deep within its core. Porter caught Sage's eye and could tell that Sage knew too. Porter knew that he had currently secured the log inside the compartment, but when he opened the door, the machine spat splinters and sawdust so forcefully that it sprayed from the stage into the dining area. Sage and Edwin and Angie were pelted with the stuff. Angie screamed and shielded her face. Edwin started sneezing. Uh, Sage ran up on the stage. Maybe you should turn it off, ma'am, he said. Porter realised he'd been frozen in horror. He quickly touched the button and the machine sputtered to a stop. He looked at the pile of shavings and sawdust in the compartment and then fearfully he looked at Jack. Jack's face was a mask of rage. His lips were pressed together in a, in a tight line. Porter knew that when those lips parted, whatever came out of them was going to be bad. It was. What came out first was not even the words, but the roar of a lion furious to discover it has been caged. He pounded the table with his fists. Finally, the words came. You absolute idiot. Is this some kind of sick joke? No, sir, Porter said. He was shaking and sweating profusely. Something must have <laughs> malfunctioned this time. It was working great before. You can ask Sage. Sage the liar? Jack asked, his words dripping venom. No matter how terrified he was, Porter wasn't going to let Jack talk about his best friend like that. Sir, Sage isn't... Don't argue with me, Jack yelled. You all seem to have forgotten who's in charge here. He stood up from the table. He looked at Porter, then at Angie, Sage and Edwin in turn. The look on his face was one of sheer disgust. I can't imagine there's a business owner in the world with a sorrier group of employees. Lazy. Incompetent. He looked at the machine and the mess of shavings and sawdust. Destructive. No wonder this business is in the toilet. I'll go down with my ship like a good captain should. But I know who's to blame for it. The crew. I've got half a mind to fire you all here. And now. But we open in 30 minutes. And look at this place. Clean it up, people. He stomped back to his office and slammed the door. Jack Shaw was mixing his metaphors there, Sage said. I'm confused. Are we on a ship or in a toilet? Angie shook her head. I don't know how you can joke at a time like this. We were going to get fired. Oh, I don't think he'll fire us, Edwin said. He won't want to hire and train new people, not with the business going under. We'll just lose our jobs when the restaurant closes. Is that supposed to be good news? Angie said. Porter sat down with his friends at the table. They were the saddest looking bunch he had ever seen. And he couldn't help but feel it was all his fault. I'm sorry, Porter said. I, I, I don't know what even happened, but I do know I let you all down. It's okay, Sage said. All inventors learn from trial and error. Today was the error part, but there will be better days. Sage rose to his feet. 
Let me go get some supplies to clean this up. Together they swept the stage and wiped down the sawdust covered tables. They used the giant wet dry vac to suck up the shavings off the carpet. Porter and Sage carried the failed machine back to its place in the storage room. Porter was desperate to look inside it and troubleshoot, but he knew that if he hoped to end his night still employed, he needed to focus on one thing, following Jack's orders to the letter, no matter how demanding or ridiculous they were. He and Porter returned to the stage and mopped up the dusty residue. By opening time, all evidence of the disaster was gone. Jack emerged from his office and surveyed the dining area. See? Porter said. Spotless. You can't even tell what happened. It'll do, Jack said. He took two steps closer to Porter, so he was standing right in his face. That dangerous piece of equipment you're responsible for could have destroyed my whole restaurant. He pointed his index finger at Porter. You're fired. The rest of you too. Get out. Now. So you make us clean up, like we're going to be opening, and then you fire us. Sage said, confused and hurt. Jack grinned through his rage. You see, unlike you all, I'm not a fool. I knew if I fired you, then asked you to clean up, the place would still be dirty. <laughs> to be fair, that's kind of genius. <laughs> um, another ex extract from the puppet carver. This, is, this feels weird to say because I am reading the puppet carver, but I'm reading the puppet carver inside the puppet carver. It's, it's weird. Sylvester knew that he could feel now because he had felt pain beyond imagining. After he had fixed, after he had paid the fixer in money and promises he didn't look forward to keeping, the fixer had connected Sylvester to the machinery and pain had shot through his body with the force of electricity as every new nerve, muscle, bone and tendon in his body was shocked to life. The pain was so strong he seemed to be able to see it, even hear it, as its intensity drowned out the sounds of his own screams. Jesus. <laughs> but since Sylvester had paid the price in pain, now he could feel pleasure too. As he walked the city streets, he could feel fresh air in his new lungs. He crossed the street, went into the park and touched the bark of a tree. Hard, rough. He stopped at an ice cream truck and bought a cone just so he could touch his lips to its coldness. A lady walked by with a fluffy white dog on a leash. Excuse me, could I pet your dog? Sylvester asked her. The lady smiled. Sure, Sophie loves everybody. Sylvester knelt down and buried his newly sensate hands in the dog's fluffy coat. Tears sprang to his eyes. Now he knew what soft meant. Thank you, Sylvester said to the dog's owner. The woman looked at him strangely. She said, you're welcome, but quickly walked away. Sylvester looked down at his hands. They felt alive. For the first time since his creation, he felt alive. His hands itched and burned in desperation. All he could think about was what he wanted to touch next. Oh, th these are like separate stories with cliffhangers and I absolutely love it. I love how this is going so far. Oh my gosh, okay. Jack sat alone in his office looking at the evening's new re uh, few receipts. The only good thing about his situation was that he'd finally fired his idiot employees so he could at least wallow in his misery and peace. He knew if he went home, Becky would, ha would want to talk to him about whatever new ways she had found to spend the money that they didn't have. He knew he should have a talk with Becky about finances, but he couldn't bring himself to do it yet. Becky had married him in part because he was a good catch with a promising future. How could he tell her he hadn't made good on that promise? Would she even stay with him if the money ran out? This was a woman who grew up with a monster, with a, a monster, a mother telling her, it's just as easy to love a rich man as a poor man, and who had jokingly suggested that the words for poorer uh, be struck from their wedding vows. Tick, tick. What was that noise? Jack didn't know if it had been going on a while without him noticing or if it had just started. Either way, now that he had heard it, he couldn't stop hearing it. Tick. Tick. It sounded like an especially loud watch or a ticking time bomb. Had somebody planted a bomb in the restaurant? If they had, it was a blessing. Jack tried to turn his attention back to his bookkeeping, but the noise was too distracting. Tick. Tick. It was more than distracting. It was maddening. What was that Edgar Allan Poe story Jack had read in high school? 
where the guy kills the old man and then is driven crazy by the non-stop beating sound of the old man's heart. It was like that. Tick. Tick. The sound seemed to be coming from behind the stage. Maybe it had something to do with one of the animatronics. Well, there was no way to get any work done with this sound rattling around in his brain. He might as well try to find the source and see if he could make it stop. Tick. Tick. The sound was louder when he was on the stage, so he was definitely getting warmer. He went backstage to the storage room. Tick. Tick. <laughs> the sound was much louder now. It seemed to be coming from the back of the room behind an old dusty curtain one of his idiot employees had hung up for some reason. He pulled back the curtain. Tick. Tick. The sound was much louder now. Unbearably, unbearably loud. Jack clamped his hands over his ears. He looked at the disabled animatronics lined up like figures in a wax museum. They weren't where the noise was coming from. Tick. Tick. It was coming from the contraption, the horrible mechanical abomination that, f that fool Porter had made. The ticking sound, clearly coming from deep inside the machine's bowels, was making it shake so hard it seemed in danger of falling over. Jack pushed the button on the outside, but nothing happened. He opened the door and the sound grew so loud he was sure it could be heard from outside the building. Tick. 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 There was some type of control panel inside the machine. Maybe if he just stepped in for a moment he could find the right button to make the horrible ticking stop. He stepped inside. It was a tight space. Jack hated tight spaces. The door slid shut with a click. He reached out to open it, but there was no handle on the inside. He thought of banging on the door and yelling, but there was no one there to hear him. And even if there were, there was no way he could be heard over the horrible ticking, which was now so loud it felt like it was coming from inside his own skull. But then the ticking was drowned out by the whirring of machinery the contraption appeared to have turned on. He looked at the walls of the machine. They were lined with circular blades that had started to spin and were now extending from the walls towards his body. Or is it that idiot could call this machine? The puppet carver? Jack's heart pounded in terror. He was going to be carved. There was no way to escape. All around him, the sharp metal blades reached toward his body, less than an inch from making contact with his arms, his legs, his face. That was it. He was going to die. And painfully. How long would it take, he wondered, for someone to find his body? No one would think to look for him here. Not until there was a smell. Jack shut his eyes and prepared for the worst. Bang. <laughs> he gasped, startled by the deafening noise. The loud bang was followed by a cloud of black smoke that filled the small space where Jack was trapped. There was a smell of ozone. <laughs> yes, I made it into the story. Oh, do you think this is the writer's way of putting me into a story? <laughs> Okay, okay, I'm, I'm joking. He coughed and wondered if he could, oh my god, asphyxiate, 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 that's it, before the blades in the machine had time to shred him. Wait, the blades. The blades had stopped spinning. The machine was quiet. It must have malfunctioned in some way. The door slid open, releasing the smoke from the compartment. The machine made a sad sputtering noise and then was still. Jack was alive. He couldn't believe it. He stepped out of the compartment like he was stepping into a new, better world. He looked himself over. No harm done. Not to him, anyway. The puppet carver might be broken beyond repair, but it hadn't really worked right in the first place. Jack felt himself smiling. When was the last time he had smiled genuinely? He couldn't even remember. But now, back from the cliff's edge of death, there seemed to be so many reasons to smile. The problems that had consumed him before didn't seem as important. Money didn't matter that much. All that mattered was that he was alive. Jack walked out the building. He looked out, up at the night sky. The stars sparkled and the moon blanketed um, the world in a silver glow. It was so beautiful that tears sprang to his eyes. When was the last time he had really seen the moon and stars? When was the last time he had cried? Looking back at the last decade of his life, the only feelings he could remember were anger and fear. Anger at his employees, at his wife, at his son. Fear of losing money, power, status. What kind of a life was that? Well, that stopped now. It was a new day. 
well, a new knight anyway. He was going to be nicer to his wife, to his son, to his employees, to all the random people he transacted with in day-to-day -day life. Jack felt his heart brimming with love and kindness. He was like Ebenezer Scrooge in A Christmas Carol after his encounter with the ghosts. No longer a mean old... old miser. <laughs> but a man who could find the goodness in life and people and even within himself. Jack got in his car. How fortunate he was to have such a nice car. How fortunate he was to have a car at all. Many people were not so lucky. He started the car and headed toward home. He hoped Becky was still awake. He had a lot to say to her. Oh, he said as he drove by the Golden Heifer. He turned back to the restaurant and pulled into the drive through line. When it, it was his turn... The voice on the intercom said, Thank you for choosing Golden Haifa. Please order when you're ready. Actually, I have a question to ask you, Jack said. Yes, the voice said. Are you the young lady who is working the drive through Tuesday night? He asked. Um, yes, sir. She sounded uncomfortable. Good. I've got something I need to say to you. I'll just pull up to the window, okay? Uh, would you like to speak to the manager? No, my beef is with you, Jack laughed. Get it, beef, because cause you sell hamburgers. He couldn't tell if the drive through worker thought this was funny or not. When he pulled up to the window, the young woman said, Oh, you. Yes, me, Jack said. But I'm a very different me than I was last night. I wanted to apologise for my behaviour. You'll be learning a new job, and you were doing your best and being very polite, and I was rude. I'm sorry. Thank you, the young woman said. But her inflection rose as if she were asking a question. Ha! <laughs> banged it. Clearly she was finding this encounter puzzling. Thank you, Jack said, for your politeness and understanding. He sat there and smiled at her. You're welcome. The young woman looked at the line of cars growing behind Jack's vehicle. Did you want to order anything, sir? She asked. No, I'm good. He found himself chuckling. I'm, I'm really, I'm really, really good. Uh, you have a nice night now. You too. Did he did he have drugs or something? <laughs> did he do drugs? Don't do drugs, kid. uh, uh do, kids. Eh. If it does turn out that he he did drugs in the end, then people are just gonna be like, that's not how it works. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know why. I don't know why I'm talking about this. Um, Jack drove away, feeling the weight of one of his regrets lifting. But fixing one isolated incident like a drive-through dust-up was easy. With Becky, with Tyson, there were years of bad behaviour on his part. Way more than he could fix with a simple, I'm sorry. An idea popped into Jack's head. Donuts. Donuts would be a start. Back when he and Becky had been young and broke, they used to meet for dates at the Donkey Dough Man, an all-night donut place near the copy shop where Becky had been working at the time. Despite its stupid name, the Donkey Dough Man was the perfect place for a cheap date. The two of them would scrape up enough money for a donut each. Chocolate frosted for Becky and maple frosted for Jack, and two cups of coffee. The manager didn't mind that they only spent five dollars and took up a booth for hours talking and drinking cup after cup of coffee. Or, if he did, he never said anything. That was back when he and Becky really talked to each other. Before the money, before parenthood, before all the stresses of responsible adult life, they talked earnestly uh, about their dreams, their goals, their future. If Jack brought home donuts from the Donkey Dough Man, maybe it would remind her of those conversations. Maybe it would be the first step toward getting them talking again. There was no street parking near the donut shop, so Jack had to use the parking garage a block away. He wasn't thrilled by this fact, really. The, dun the Donkey Dough Man wasn't in the safest neighbourhood to be wandering at night, but he had become increasingly convinced that showing up with a bag of donuts might be the path back to Becky's heart. It was a thoughtful gesture, and it had been a long time since he had been thoughtful. 